It started with a stomach virus, but I got over it. I was feeling fine. Then I got these strange tingling sensations in my feet and had trouble walking up the stairs. My wife rushed me to the hospital. Now I'm lying here, completely paralyzed. Everybody assures me that I'll get better. I want to believe them. I really do. But it's like I've fallen into a deep, dark hole and can't get out. I feel alone. And I'm scared. You are about to learn about a fascinating, paralyzing disorder of the nervous system from which, fortunately, most people get better. To introduce our program, we're honored to present Professor Arthur Asbury, who is the Vice Dean of Research at the University of Pennsylvania. Because a GBS is so unpredictable, uh, uh, this uh, educational video is intended to let you understand the expectations of the disease, how it worsens, how it improves, what the tempo of that is, and what your expectations might be for the illness. Uh, the main thing to know uh, is that the outlook is very good and that the great majority of people who are affected make a full recovery. I'm Tom Peterson, news director at radio station WGN in Chicago. And I'm your host for this look at Guillain-Barre syndrome. I know what GBS is like because I had it myself. And I'm here to tell you that there is light at the end of the tunnel. Let's start our look at this puzzling illness by examining the history of GBS. In 1859, Dr. Jean Landry described an unusual paralytic condition that ascended meaning that it started at the feet and worked its way up the bodies of the people it afflicted. Of the 10 patients Landry observed, two died from breathing problems while the rest recovered. Dr. Landry also noted that the patients lost reflexes like the knee jerk, but their minds remained intact. And this indicated that the brain is not affected in this condition, which is sometimes called Landry's ascending paralysis. 50 years later, three other French physicians, Drs. Guillain, Beret, and Stroll, observed two soldiers with rapidly ascending weakness. They did lumbar punctures and discovered elevated protein levels in spinal fluid, a finding that remains a confirmatory test for GBS to this day. The disorder originally described by doctors Landry, Guillain, Barre, and Stroll is now most commonly called Guillain-Barre syndrome and abbreviated GBS. It came briefly to public attention when it developed in some people who received the 1976-77 swine flu vaccine. Even after the 140 years since GBS was first described, GBS researchers have many unanswered questions. To begin to understand what is currently known, we must start with the basic dynamics of the human nervous system. Doctors refer to the brain and spinal cord as the central nervous system. The central nervous system is not involved in GBS. The other nerves of the body, those that go to and from the limbs, skin, joints, muscles, and internal organs are called the peripheral nerves. It is this peripheral nervous system that is damaged in GBS. Like an intricate network of wires, these nerves carry electrical signals throughout our bodies. The incoming messages that sense our surroundings travel through the peripheral nerves and up the spinal cord to the brain. These peripheral nerves that sense feelings such as touch, hot and cold, are called sensory nerves. When the sensory nerves are damaged, as in GBS, a person can't feel accurately. When we want to move, the brain sends a signal down the spinal cord and out through the peripheral nerves to muscles. These peripheral nerves are called motor nerves. When the motor nerves are damaged, as in GBS, weakness or paralysis develops. Here's what actually happens inside your body in most cases of GBS. Many peripheral nerves are covered with myelin. Myelin is a fatty substance that insulates the nerve cells. Myelin also enhances the transmission of the electrical signals that travel in nerves. In most cases of GBS, this myelin covering is damaged, which slows or interrupts the signals, creating strange sensations in the body 
and paralyzing muscles. The central conducting portion of the nerve is called the axon. Sometimes GVS involves damage of the nerve axon itself as well as the myelin covering. And damage of the axon may explain why some patients have a poor recovery. When physicians speak of a disease, we usually understand a specific cause and effect relationship. A specific factor triggers a specific medical problem. In GBS, we diagnose the disease or the disorder more by the set of symptoms that a patient presents to us with, their complaints, and by the findings we uh, obtain from examining them and lab studies. Uh, so it's more appropriate, we find, to label GBS as a syndrome. What are the symptoms of GBS? Typically, a patient will see their family doctor because of a new sense of weakness that keeps getting worse, such as a clumsy walk or difficulty with climbing stairs. I don't know, doctor. I, my legs feel like they weigh a ton. I'm having trouble sleeping. I haven't slept in a couple days. It's difficult for you to even stand direct. Usually, this weakness starts in the feet and legs and moves up the body. Do you feel this? A little bit more than down below. Squeeze my hands. It's hard this weakness is often accompanied by abnormal sensations such as numbness or tingling of the fingers or toes. Sometimes these strange sensations arrive even before the weakness. About 50% of patients have a history of a recent infection such as a sore throat or diarrhea before their GBS develops. Besides infections, GBS can also develop after such diverse events as surgery, or an immunization. If the patient is seen very early in their illness, perhaps because they have concern about some new abnormal sensations, but they haven't yet developed the more obvious symptoms of weakness, the doctor may have difficulty making an accurate diagnosis. Real deep. On examination, the doctor will usually find diminished or absent reflexes, such as the knee jerk. These findings are usually enough to raise the strong possibility of GBS and the patient is often referred to a neurologist to confirm the diagnosis. The patient with suspected GBS may rapidly deteriorate with difficulty breathing and fluctuations in vital signs such as blood pressure and heart rate. To watch for these potential complications, most patients with suspected GBS are hospitalized and placed in an intensive care unit for close observation. When GBS patients are hospitalized, they undergo additional tests. A live spinal tap usually reveals elevated fluid protein without increase of the cell count. A special electrical activity test called nerve conduction velocity electromyography, or NCV-EMG, is obtained. In GBS patients, this test shows abnormal conduction of nerve electrical impulses. Additional studies may also be ordered to rule out other disorders and confirm the diagnosis of GBS. GBS is an equal opportunity disorder and can strike anyone at any age, adults, children, males and females, all races, and even during pregnancy. Before we discuss the care of the GBS patient, let's turn our attention briefly to what is going on in the body, the underlying nerve damage and its possible causes. The underlying problem in GBS is nerve damage. The damage is generally accepted as being caused by inflammation, by the patient's own immune system. To understand GBS better, let's look at the body's immune system. The purpose of the immune system is to protect the body from infecting organisms such as bacteria and viruses by recognizing and attacking them. The body recognizes these invading bugs by their chemical composition. The immune system of an infected person trains antibodies to recognize certain chemicals in an invading bug's outer coating. The antibodies then attack the bugs that have those chemicals in their outer wall. In this way, the immune system attacks the bacteria to protect the person, but in some GBS patients, something seems to go wrong. It seems that in GBS, the patient's immune system attacks not only the infecting bug, but also accidentally the patient's peripheral nerves. One theory for why nerves get accidentally damaged is that they contain some of the same chemicals that are found in the bacteria. This explanation is appropriately called the molecular mimicry innocent bystander theory. Many complex factors are involved in the workings of the immune system. 
As our knowledge of these factors deepens, our overall understanding of GBS will improve. Now, let's turn our attention to the treatment of GBS. Once a diagnosis of GBS is made, doctors and patients face several issues. How sick will the patient get? For how long? And what treatments are available? Well, it's difficult to predict how long a patient will be sick. In general, younger patients tend to do better, and those patients who receive certain treatments also recover faster. But it's important to note that many patients do make a good recovery in spite of being so sick. Two types of therapies are usually considered for the newly diagnosed GBS patient. First, special treatments are used to address nerve damage and shorten the course of GBS. Second, general supportive measures are used to treat the paralyzed patient. First, let's look at the therapies currently used to deal with nerve damage. One such treatment is called plasmapheresis, an exchange process that removes some of the patient's blood. The blood is spun in a special centrifuge. The liquid portion or plasma is then discarded and the blood cells are returned to the patient. This blood cleansing treatment can shorten the course of GBS and often results in patients walking sooner and getting off of a ventilator more quickly. Plasmapheresis may work because it removes the liquid portion of blood that contains harmful antibodies that injure the nerves, so the nerves can begin to heal sooner and faster. Plasmapheresis requires special equipment, usually only found in major medical centers. Another widespread treatment for GBS is intravenous administration of high-dose immune globulins, abbreviated IVIG. This treatment can be given conveniently to a patient in almost any setting. IVIG medication contains antibodies from healthy people. It helps the GBS patient by loading good antibodies onto the damaged nerves and crowding harmful antibodies away. Both treatments, plasmapheresis and IVIG, have advantages and drawbacks. Your physicians will discuss these treatment options with you. Research has shown that both treatments should be given within two weeks of the onset of symptoms. If treatment is delayed, the benefits are substantially reduced. So early diagnosis is a critical factor in the recovery of the GBS patient. Now let's discuss general measures used to treat the paralyzed GBS patient. These treatments are usually overseen by a team of physicians such as an internist, neurologist, lung specialist, and also intensive care nurses and physical therapists. Paralyzed patients are prone to several complications including skin breakdown or bed sores, phlebitis or blood clots, and lung congestion or collapse. To reduce the risk of bed sores, the patient is usually placed on a special low pressure mattress or bed or a bed that turns the patient to keep shifting their weight. Nurses and physical therapists position the patient's arms and legs to reduce the risk of compressing nerves that lie just under the skin. We also begin passive range of motion exercises. Right there. Okay. Bending the patient's joints to reduce the risk of developing frozen joints and shortened tendons. To prevent foot drop, devices such as high top sneakers, bunny boots or similar devices are placed on the feet to keep the feet from falling down. Paralyzed patients are at risk to develop phlebitis or blood clots and leg veins. Various methods are used to prevent this from happening, including elastic or anti-embolism stockings, leg boots that intermittently squeeze the calves and thighs, and injections of blood thinning agents. 40% of new GBS patients require assisted breathing by an apparatus called a mechanical ventilator. If the patient has trouble swallowing, a feeding tube may be needed to provide adequate nutrition. All of the treatments just described are customized to meet the needs of the individual patient and the severity of their problems. GBS patients usually stay in the intensive care unit and acute care hospital unit until they're stabilized. They're breathing on their own and they're beginning to show some return of muscle function. This healing process can take anywhere from a few days to several weeks or even longer. Most patients go from their usual healthy state to maximum weakness in a short time, a few days to at most four weeks. This maximum weakness may last for days to weeks and then recovery begins. Some patients start to recover soon and their recovery is quite rapid. Some patients stay weak longer and take a longer time to improve. Generally, younger patients recover sooner than older patients. And patients treated with plasmapheresis or IVIG usually get better sooner than patients who don't get these treatments. Some of that Guillain-Barre is very predictable. 
in that people get worse and then they get better. Um, what's unpredictable about it is the speed at which that happens, and that varies pretty much with every situation. They're going to die. No, I'm sure you're going to be okay. Another thing is that the family and the patient are both usually very scared to be in the hospital, to be diagnosed with something that they are unfamiliar with, and it helps them to know that their reactions are very normal, um, to understand that, um, that these, their fears, their anxieties, the things that they may, they may be thinking about that everyone that I've ever encountered has pretty much the same reactions and to know that that's normal. Remember that most patients recover no matter how sick they get. So in spite of how bad things look, it's good to have an optimistic attitude. The GBS Foundation through its local support group chapters has volunteers to talk with families and visit patients. Um, it was really strange with, with me how Gail and Bray started. I woke up one Sunday morning and noticed some sensation on the end of my tongue and on the end of my fingertips. And at first I thought that maybe it, w it was because of a new detergent and that I was just allergic to something. And I was unable to sleep because I noticed some heaviness that was beginning, they were beginning down on my feet and up in my legs. And I went to get up in the middle of the night and I found I couldn't walk. And I went back to bed and I waited as long as I could until I woke up my son and told him that I thought, something terrible was happening and I needed to go to the hospital. I think probably the worst part in, in the recovery process was when I really couldn't blink my eyes and what they did was they then put drops in my eyes and then I really couldn't see anymore and my ears began to fill up with fluid for some reason so I really couldn't hear. And my doctor was saying, Sally, don't worry, you're going to have a mild case, you're going to have a mild case. So he was telling me that, but then I was very confused because I knew what my body was doing. It didn't feel very mild at the time. Um, that was kind of the, the bottom. And then, day by day, it was, it was slow, but it was also a miracle. You know, it was almost as if every single day you should be given a lollipop because your body began kicking in. Once the patient has stabilized and is showing some improvement, rehabilitation activities are increased. The goal is to help guide the patient towards full recovery as the nerves heal. Frequently, patients are transferred to inpatient rehabilitation facilities. The typical GBS patient entering a rehab facility may be very weak, unable to stand or walk on their own, and unable to use their arms or hands for routine activities. In a rehabilitation center, the patient will be kept very busy with therapy activities. And the patient and loved ones will be facing some new emotional challenges. Once the patient's symptoms cease advancing, there is a tremendous sense of relief. However, this relief is also accompanied uh, by feelings of the enormity of the task ahead in terms of the rehab, and also some feelings of disappointment that the illness doesn't reverse as quickly as it came about. Uh, as the rehab progresses, uh, the patient will probably go through some very common emotional reactions. Disbelief, shock, I can't believe this happened to me, uh, considerable anger and frustration, I've worked so hard, I'm not getting as f better as fast as I would like, um, even despair at times. The family and loved ones can play an important role before, during, and after therapy to help the patient through rehabilitation and return to home life. Psychological counseling may be helpful, not just for the patient, but also for their loved ones. A new medical team begins to work with GBS patients in the rehab facility. The team often consists of a physiatrist, physical therapist, occupational therapist, speech therapist, recreational therapist, social workers, psychologists and psychiatrists. Like other aspects of care for GBS, rehabilitation is customized to the individual patient's specific problems. Rehab therapy may start out with aquatic therapy in a pool. The patient, often being very weak, is lowered into the pool with full support. The warm water soothes muscles, which may be sore from initial attempts at use after a long period of inactivity. 
The buoyancy of water helps the patient take their first steps. The next step in rehab is usually wheelchair training. Mat exercises and arm exercises with pulleys and weights help rebuild upper and lower body strength. As more strength returns, rehabilitation progresses to walking with the use of parallel bars. Then with a walker, a cane, and then eventually without any assistance devices. I believe that there are three important principles that individuals with Guillain-Barre syndrome should remember as they go through their recovery and rehabilitation. First, physical rehabilitation does not accelerate nerve healing. It does not create movement where movement does not yet exist. Only time accomplishes nerve healing. Physical rehabilitation, however, does optimize neuromuscular recovery. Exercise builds muscular strength, improves cardiopulmonary endurance, which has been diminished. Exercise also aids in the emotional recovery from Guillain-Barre syndrome. Second, regular daily exercise is essential. Early in the course of recovery, frequent short episodes of exercise, eight to 10 times per day are optimal. As an individual progressively improves, the exercise program is lengthened. As the individual gains strength, the exercise proceeds from a passive range of motion regimen to an active participation using weights and performing functional activities under the guidance of the person's therapist. Third, avoid fatigue. Exercise to the point of exhaustion can result in muscle injury. Individuals with Guillain-Barre syndrome must pace themselves must allow for frequent rest during their recovery and must listen to their body to guide them through how much activity to perform at any one time. During the rehab process, strength, endurance and improvement will begin to level off. The recovering GBS patient then begins to make plans to return home and therapy shifts to an outpatient basis. Most patients recover full use of their limbs. For those that don't, Assistive walking devices, ramping access, and other accommodations are part of the outpatient plan. The recovery from Guillain-Barre uh, can take anywhere from days to weeks to months, even longer. I think that patience is probably the most important attribute that a person with Guillain-Barre syndrome must develop. Recurrence of GBS is very rare. Up to 30% of people feel some residual tingling or weakness after two or more years. Those people who don't have a complete recovery face problems that challenge the body and spirit. But even these problems can be adapted to. I'm Robert Benson. This is my wife, Estelle Benson. Uh, we are the two that started the GBS Foundation. Uh, I had Guillain-Barre back in 1979 into 1980. And when I was in the hospital, still at that time, wanted to find someone to stop to talk to me because of the fact that we knew no one who had GBS. And uh, we wanted to have someone talk to me and see if they had recovered and possibly help me to help in my, my morale in recovering. The focus of contemporary Guillain-Barre syndrome research is on finding new treatments and refining existing ones. Researchers are examining the workings of the immune system to find out how the attack on the nervous system develops. Many cases of GBS begin with microbial infections. That suggests certain characteristics of microbes activate the immune system inappropriately. We're making progress in understanding how GBS develops and how the immune system interacts with triggering factors to damage nerves. Hopefully, research will ultimately enable us to treat patients more effectively. Neurologists, immunologists, virologists, and pharmacologists are all collaborating to learn how to treat this disorder and to make better therapies available when it strikes. Even though the GBS community is spread across the world, excellent resources are available to assist GBS sufferers and the people who care for them. 
The first line of support is the medical and rehabilitation services available through your medical center. We are proud to have an extraordinary medical advisory board who are the experts in the field of Guillain-Barre syndrome, some of whom have had Guillain-Barre syndrome. So it's interesting they come from both sides of the fence. Several years ago, uh, I was doing my own thing, practicing medicine, and suddenly out of the blue realized I had some numbness and tingling in my fingers and rather brushed it off. And the next day, I noticed I had difficulty walking upstairs. And then I developed numbness and tingling in my gums. And I knew by then that this probably had to be Guillain-Barre syndrome. Uh, and then I was hospitalized and in an intensive care unit and then to a rehab hospital where I learned to walk again. Uh, when I was sick with GBS, I was scared. I didn't know what my recovery would be. One of the challenges and frustrations with GBS is its unpredictability. But I think it's important to emphasize to patients and their families a degree of cautious optimism. Be patient. Realize that most people have a good outcome. Easily, the majority of people have a either full or nearly full recovery. When Bob was in intensive care for so many weeks, I vowed that we would do something about it. And it was only in the first year of his recovery, we assembled eight people in our home. And from there, it has flourished into an international organization. The main thrust of a foundation such as ours is for support. Well, we visit uh, the patients in the hospital. We send them literature. Uh, we have our own support groups that meet periodically. And uh, basically, the idea is to try to get as much information to the patient and their family so they'll understand what, what, their, uh, what GBS is all about. In addition to our regular chapters, we have sub-chapters, which address special needs of the Guillain-Barre syndrome, such as children with Guillain-Barre, infants with Guillain-Barre, pregnant ladies, CIDP, where it is a chronic form of Guillain-Barre, the Miller-Fisher variant. So we try to address all the phases of Guillain-Barre syndrome and address the needs of the patients. After a Guillain-Barre syndrome support group meeting, people leave like a family because there's a certain commonality that they share that nobody else can share. And people walk away feeling much more inspired, much more hopeful. They have wonderful role models where they can see, yes, indeed, recovery does occur. You may write or call the foundation at these numbers or email us at this internet address. Guillain-Barre syndrome even has its own chronicle. No Laughing Matter is an autobiographical recounting by Joseph Heller, the author of Catch-22, of his recovery from Guillain-Barre syndrome. Joseph Heller, along with screen actors Rachel Levin and Andy Griffith, have recovered from GBS and are honorary members of the GBS Foundation Board. It's hard because you learn to live with things and so you kind of accept that this is the way, you know, some people wear glasses all the time and they don't really think about wearing glasses, that's just part of them. That's sort of how it's become with me. Guillain-Barre syndrome plunges its sufferers into a debilitating, frightening ordeal from which they must struggle to emerge. But with early diagnosis, proper care and rehabilitation, the prognosis for GBS patients is bright. I'm Tom Peterson, and I'm a graduate of the GBS School of Hard Knocks. Just remember, if you have GBS, or if you have a friend or a loved one who has GBS, there is light at the end of the tunnel. So be patient, and don't lose hope.